Hi, this is Tom from MVP Chess. Welcome back to my series on Bobby Fischer's seminal work, My 60 Memorable Games. In this video, we'll be analyzing game number five that Fischer played in 1959 versus Rosetto in Mar del Plata. As always, we really appreciate it if you could like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks for your support. Okay, Fischer opened with pawn to e4, best by test. And after c5, knight f3, Rosetto plays pawn to e6. Now we saw in game number one versus Sherwin that Fisher opted for a King's Indian attack setup against this Sicilian variation. But instead here, Fisher plays d4, open Sicilian on the board. Takes, takes, pawn to a6. Now, this is not the knight or variation. Okay, pawn to a6 is featured in the Nidorf, of course. This is actually known as a Sicilian con. The downside of this opening um, is that white is able to play c4 here and establish a so-called Marazzi bind on the position. Uh, so this promises white a really nice space advantage, and white is hoping to just cramp black to death in this position. Queen c7, knight c3, knight f6, Fisher here plays bishop d3, um, which he criticized. He thought the best move in this position, which modern theory agrees with, is to play pawn to a3. It's, a, it's an idea, a key idea for black in these con setups, is to play the bishop to b4 if white opts for the Maroxy bind. Bishop d3 instead, and after knight c6, bishop e3, Rosetto here decides to exchange on d4, but Fisher points out that black actually had a much better continuation here after knight e5, okay? Hitting this pawn on c4, and after rook c1, knight fg4 would actually promise black a slight advantage out of the opening hitting this precious dark squared bishop on e3. But instead, Rosetto opts to exchange on d4. Fisher recaptures. We have bishop c5, developing with gain of tempo. Notice this bishop is currently undefended, which is why Fisher maintains the tension and drops this bishop back to c2. Now, if black captures on d4, Fisher can recapture with the queen. Pawn to d6. Fisher castles. Bishop d7. And now Fisher plays knight to a4. And he said in the annotations that this forces some exchanges which might give white a microscopic edge in this position. And we can see... White is definitely slightly better, but it's it's not much. Blacks manage to exchange off two sets of minor pieces, okay, which is always beneficial for the player with a space disadvantage. If you're able to exchange off minor pieces in the position, this relieves the cramped nature of your position. But Fisher still has more space and slightly more active pieces. So we have rook d8. Fisher centralizes the rooks and plays rook c1 here. He notes that taking this pawn on d6, okay, maybe some of you spotted that this pawn was on prees, doesn't promise white much. We would have an exchange here. White would be forced to capture on d8. And although Fisher has a 3v2, queenside pawn majority and a bishop versus a knight. Black has compensation in the form of control over this active uh, open file, I should say, and the active position of the knight. So this position would be dead equal. So that's why Fisher just opted to play rook ac1, getting the last rook into the game. Queen a5. And 
Fisher plays the queen into b6, forcing an exchange of queens. I think he did that because the knight comes to this knight out, nice outpost on b6 and looks to pressure this bishop, which Rosetto moves. Bishop c6, hitting the pawn here. So Fisher defends pawn to f3. This is a very common structure in the Meroxy bind for white to adopt bringing this pawn to f3, just creating a rock solid pawn chain that's really difficult for black to break down. And Rosetto plays knight d7 here. Again, trying to trade off pieces. He's the one with a space disadvantage, so this benefits him. And also trying to kick this active knight um, off its perch on b6. So, what did Fisher play in this position? I'll give you a chance to try to find the game continuation. And the hint is that Fisher did not trade the knight on d7. Okay, he found a much more enterprising maneuver with this knight. Pause your videos and try to see if you can find it. So Fisher knew that exchanging knights wouldn't promise him much. And one thing that strong players do, and obviously Fisher was one of the strongest players of all time, is he sets problems for his opponent to try to solve and try to force them to go wrong. So he finds a really creative move in this position, not exchanging on d7. He noticed this, that this bishop after the knight comes to d7 is short on squares, which allows this really cool retreat by the knight, knight d5. It's not a winning move by any stretch of the imagination, but it poses some problems for his opponent. And Fisher notes in the annotation, and I'm sure um, he read his opponent's body language that he was very surprised by this move. It flustered him, caught him off guard, and provoked him to play the incorrect move in this position. Best for black here is to leave this knight on the board and play knight e5. Now Fisher can win the bishop and look to put some pressure on black's position. Okay, here white has a threat of kicking this knight and perhaps capturing on c6, but Black can actually create an artificial outpost by this knight, for this knight, by playing g5. This is a really great move. Maintaining this knight on e5 and looking to improve the position of this king in the corner by routing it to the e7 square via g7 and f6. So that would have been the best continuation. But Rosetta was flustered. He didn't know what to do. Perhaps he missed something, so he decided to capture the knight with the bishop on d5. Fisher recaptured, and rather than exchange here and be saddled with an isolated queen's pawn, apologies, Rosetto decided to push forward with e5 okay and then fisher plays b4 so from here on out the game revolves around the fight for control over the c5 square this is the key pawn break that fisher wants to play it's where his pawn majority lies he's got a 4v3 pawn majority on the queen side right now he wants to play c5 to create a pass pawn and try to win the game that way. So Rosetto plays pawn to g6. I think this was designed to perhaps prevent this bishop coming from f5 and challenging one of the key defenders over the c5 square. It also prepares his own counterplay with pawn to f5. So Rosetto is going to try to mobilize his kingside pawn majority as well to get counterplay in the position. 
So Fisher pivots then, bishop a4, putting pressure on this knight and hoping to get this move c5 through. But Rosetta holds the bounds, b6, gaining more control over this, over this pawn break. And then Fisher does a rook lift in this position. And Rosetta was guilty, and we've all been there, I, I do this all the time in my own games, of simply asking, what is my opponent's idea with rook d3? What is my opponent's next move? Okay. Rosetto plays a very natural move, pawn to f5, seeking to expand on the king side, but he missed Fisher's key idea in this position, shifting this rook to a3. Now, Fisher's threatening to take the knight on d7 and then capture the pawn on a6. So this forces Rosetto to play knight b8 in this position. So I'm going to turn it over to you. White to play. What did Fisher play here? Pause your videos. Of course, we've been talking about it for a while now. The fight in this game is all about the c5 square. Fisher came up with this nice rook lift idea to force the knight back. So, of course, pawn to c5. Great move. This is the time to play it right after the knight retreats and this really brings fisher's position to life and black is on the back foot now we have a series of captures on c5 so fisher has gotten the past pawn that he's wanted it's already advanced to the fifth rank and fisher's rooks are also really active right now the other thing to notice about this position is that fisher has his classic Bishop versus knight endgame. So white has a significant advantage here. King g7, rook b3. Okay, that rook wasn't doing much on a3 anymore. Fisher brings it to an open file and prepares to try to invade on the 7th rank. Rook to f7. Pawn to d6. Really nice move by Fisher. Okay, and this is twofold. One, Fisher wants to advances past pawn. Past pawns are meant to be pushed. But this also allows the rook to infiltrate on the seventh rank. It gives this rook on c5 a foothold into the position with rook c7. Of course, in this position, rook takes d6 is not a thing. This knight on b8 would just be hanging. That's why Rosetto played knight d7. In comes the rook, rook c7. Okay. Fisher's looking to establish control over the seventh rank with his rooks. And after knight f8, rook bb7, Fisher's got the hogs, man. This is where you want your rooks. You want your rooks on the seventh rank, ideally, to have this battery. It's really difficult for black to deal with. Black has no choice in this position but to exchange. And after D takes C7, the pawn is now one square away from promotion. And Fisher has a completely winning position. After Rook C8, Fisher found a great move. It's the only winning move in the position, but I'm sure it was one that he foresaw. So pause your videos. Okay. How can, and I'll give you a hint, how can white put black into Zugzwang in this position. Pause your videos. What did Fisher play? Congratulations if you found the awesome move. Bishop b3. Boom! What a move. Silent but deadly. Black is completely busted in this position now. And the reason being is that black only has pawn moves left. And you're saying, what are, you, what are you talking about, Tom? The king's on the board. We have the knight on f8. We have this rook on c8. Well, let's examine what happens if these pieces move. On knight d7, there's bishop e6. Thank you very much. On king f6, 
Okay, we want ideally to centralize the king in the end game, but then there's a tactical problem in this position. Rook b8, okay, bringing the king to f6. Now this knight is undefended, so rook b8 just wins on the spot. So all black can do in this position is to play pawn moves. And Fisher's plan is to just simply exhaust black of his remaining reserve tempi. A4. Okay, choose another pawn. This pawn can't move anymore. H6, H3, G5, G4. The H pawn's immobile now, as is the E pawn. And after this exchange, black resigned. Understandably, there are no moves left for black to play. As we discussed before, Knight, e, uh, knight d7 here would just run into bishop e6. Thank you very much. Pin and win. Knight g6 would lose to the simple bishop e6. If the king were to move, let's say to f6, once again, rook b8, skewering the piece. And what else do we have here? Um... Instead of king f6, let's say knight g6. Again, bishop e6 just wins. And last but not least, if this rook moves anywhere, just hoping to shuffle back and forth. White's got the killer move. c8 equals queen with check. So, very understandable why, after this position... After h takes g4, y black resigned. He knew that he did not have a good move in the posi in this position. And this is an absolute... If you look up Zugzwang in the dictionary, first you want to probably know what it means. It's a German word for compulsion to move, but as we use it in chess, it's basically if you make any move in the position, you're just going to harm your own position. Um, so it's almost as if when you're in Zugzwang... You wish that you could just pass the turn back to your opponent. But of course, that's against rules in chess. You have to move. And that's why Zuzhuang is such an important endgame concept to know. And if you're first being introduced to it, or you're looking to improve your play in Zuzhuang, this is a great game to study. Especially this key move, Bishop e3. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed the analysis. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and turn on your notifications. You're not going to want to miss any of the future installments. I will see you next for game number six. Take care.